Hello and welcome back to the Premier Chels, your source for all things Premier League, but starting with Chelsea first. Coming to you on your speakers and headsets, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jackie from Houston, I have Rahul here from Connecticut, and today we welcome some very special guests in Ian and Noah from the Toon Army Miami. Welcome guys to the Premier Chels, how are you doing today? All good fella, thank you for having us man. Absolutely, it's going to be exciting to talk to you guys about all things Newcastle maybe today. And Rahul, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about some of the questions you have today. Yeah, so thank you for joining us, guys. Uh, just to get started here, uh, we'll talk about the Toon Army Miami group and how it started and uh, how many members you have and where you meet to watch games. Uh, and is there, a big, I guess, an, a bigger group, maybe something similar to what we have in Chelsea in America. So uh, we'll start there. Yeah, well, you know, Toonami Miami has been around, um, I guess, for since 2007, 2006. It was started off um, by the founder of the Toonami uh, in New York, who's Barry, who's actually based up in like uh, DC now. Um, I've been in Miami since two, well, coming to Miami since 2008. I've been living here since 2013. So our group has gone up and down since then. So, you know, as a club, Newcastle, it's not exactly the easiest club. Uh, to get people excited about, especially for the last 14 years. So our group has gone from 25, 30 down to like five and then back up again and around in circles. So uh, we're probably at about 10 right now, but I'm sure that's going to grow a little bit more as we go. And yeah, we have two nominees across the whole country. So, um, you know, pretty much in every major city, there's a two nominee and there's two nominees growing up in uh, all smaller cities now. And as uh, the club kind of grows and people start getting more involved in the Premier League. So, yeah, we're excited. That's, that's definitely exciting. No way you want, wanted to add something? Yeah, so I guess um, I actually moved to Miami just for law school, and then I, I really started watching matches with the guys, like, playing on a team. So I'm like, I, I haven't been watching as much as Ian, obviously. Um, so, I mean, like, I've with, – with, like, the guys in Miami, I would say we usually have at least four or five people every match. Um, Usually, like, at least, like, you know, we, we've had, like, 10, 11 people also. Um, I'm originally from Milwaukee, and, like, there's – so, like, when I'm back home, I, I watch a lot of matches in Milwaukee, and there's actually a bar um, where I – an Arsenal bar, actually, but they have a – but that's when Newcastle fans um, join, and we watch matches there. We usually have, like, four or five people. I've been to Chicago even, and we've had, um, you know, I've met up with members of two and on me. So I feel like – you know, like we've had some struggles over the years, but you know, even in the Midwest, um, I've met people in like smaller cities like Milwaukee and bigger cities like Chicago, and you know, same in Miami. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it, right? Like, there's the Premier League is growing. Uh, clubs are around the the world, especially the top six and some of the bigger clubs like Newcastle themselves have fans all over and, and being able to just travel anywhere and catch a game with a group of fans is, is the beauty of it. So uh, definitely a, a, a good thing. And I'm sure, like you mentioned, Ian, uh, it's definitely going to be some more members joining you guys in the future uh, because the takeover has happened and it's been a long 14 years. I don't have to tell you guys, uh, but Mike Ashley is out the door and in comes PIF, PFI. Um, the investment group from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I will let you guys take it away and share your thoughts on the takeover and the excitement. And then we can touch on maybe Steve Bruce and, and what the future holds with um, Graham Jones, I believe is the interim manager, but long-term who comes in and, and who you guys would like to see. Well, I think with the takeover in the end, Newcastle have been, you know, I've been, I'm from South Shields, which is in the northeast of England, like 20 minutes from Newcastle. So I was born there, I grew up there. My whole family's from there. They're all Sunderland fans. I mean, I was the rogue that was in <laughs> Newcastle. I, I still get kicked out of people's houses to, to, to this day. Um, but yeah, we, I, you know, I was, I, my, I, my first kind of games I used to watch was before Alan Shearer was even signed for Newcastle. Wow. So in the early 90s. So this is, I've seen Newcastle come second in the Premier League twice get to the FA Cup final twice, you know, beat Barcelona in the Champions League, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. But then also on the back end of that, for the last, you know, 14 years of my, actually, apart from maybe a spell in the beginning, there's just, there was just no investment in the club. So, we, you know, it was panic investments. So if you ever saw us spend money, it was only, 
it was reactionary. So it'd be like, okay, the, it's we've rotted so far down, we're going to spend this money and then it just saves us and we're okay for a little bit and then we just rot away again. And that's why we got relegated twice um, and then came back. So it's just, it was never going to end. And that's what's happening this season. We had two solid seasons in the end with Steve Bruce, but it was rotting the whole time. And then now you can see we haven't won a game yet this season and it was going to happen again. And we're probably, if nothing had changed, we were probably going to get relegated at the end of the season. So, um, yeah, it's exciting times. We can finally invest some money into the club and grow and, you know, give back to the, the people of Newcastle and all the, the fans that come up. In the end, when we got relegated to the championship, we still had, like, the 10th best um, capacity right. in Europe, you know. And we were, in, we were playing, you know, Swansea at the time when they were in the championship and we had Marlon Harewood playing up front for us. So <laughs> we still had, we still had 52,000 people in the stands. Yeah. No, that, that, sorry, that's, sorry, that's, some, ahead, yeah. that's something amazing about Newcastle and the culture is no matter where you are in the Premier League or if you're in the championship, the fan base and, and you guys are evidence of that is very, very strong all, all throughout the world. And, and even in Newcastle, I mean, we've heard a little bit about Ian, you know, background in, in becoming a Newcastle fan, rivaling your your family and abandoning Sutherland for lack of a better word what about you Noah what's your background into why you started supporting Newcastle so I mean I I honestly um I, I grew up in the United States I grew up in Milwaukee um I started watching soccer like in 1998 I I really started watching it because um my mom is from Romania and Romania was actually good at soccer then so I started watching them um I became a Newcastle fan literally because I, I was a fan of Alan Shearer and I, I just liked the jersey. Um, stayed like I was I was I wasn't like like diehard fan, but I was right. you know I followed the club to a degree. And then like after the 2006 World Cup is when I really felt like fell in love with like soccer in general. So then like I really I followed the club like you know every single match and so forth. Like since then like I've you know been a diehard fan more or less. Um, I, I've been to Newcastle actually. I've been to a match wow. once, and that was that was a great experience. I will say that. Um, like the people of Newcastle are so friendly. Like I, I can't even describe like what like how nice they were to me. Like like they like they knew I was not from there, but they were so friendly. It's insane. Wow, that's incredible. They've actually made it out there. That's a really great story to share. So I know Ian, you you shared your thoughts a little bit on the the takeover. Noah, what about you on on having the new ownership coming in i mean like i feel like the biggest thing that i'm excited for is just like at least and i mean ian touched on it for a little bit it's just like having like an ownership group who actually you know wants us to see us you know make improvements succeed you know like challenge teams it's like i'm not asking for a team you know it's just you know you know finishing first in the premier league every year i just want a team that at least competes and under Mike Ashley, it was getting ridiculous, you know, like, I'm not, I'm, you know, Newcastle shouldn't be competing with Norwood City, just, just being honest. No, look, you're Absolutely. absolutely right. Yeah, a, a club of Newcastle stature and size. I mean, we've seen them for the history, of course, recent history with players of Alan Shearer. I mean, we were talking recently as uh, Demba Ba, who even played for Chelsea himself, Papi Cisse, those strikers forward going through was an incredible time and then just to see them go up and down is a little bit difficult and of course you guys know Christian uh, from kickoff coffee he's a huge fan of Newcastle as well and we've known the history of them and it's, it's tough to watch but what's the short-term future what do you guys expect now that takeover is completed what are you looking for in the next eight months here or the next six months here with the takeover to happen Ian we'll start with you well we need a new manager it's the first thing hopefully I think it'll happen pretty soon I think it'll happen after the Chelsea game, pretty much next week, I'm sure they haven't got someone already in mind. It'll be pretty because there's an international break, I think. So they'll want to get someone in as quick as possible. Um, we'll probably get a football director in too, because in the end, the, the takeover group aren't necessarily the most experienced football people in the world. So you need to get someone in that can actually manage the club as well. So I'm sure that will be, I think they'll probably come in at the same time, to be honest. Like they'll, they're almost like a joint kind of deal. Um, so then they're together um, and then after that it's get as many points as we can before Christmas um, hopefully we can get to 18 20 points by January right kind of we'll still be down there but you know get as many points and then we need to go sign some players in January you know we need to go and sign about four players I think um, in January and not necessarily like big superstars or anything like that we just need to improve our squad and uh, and sign four starters um, in the team and 
and then just be solid for the rest of the season, stay up. And then after that, well, after that, it's all gone, all guns blazing. Let's go. Look, that's definitely fair. And Noah, from your perspective, I know Ian's touched on some signings, potentially any names being linked with Newcastle or any names that you would love to see coming in? I've seen, um, I've seen a lot of guys from Barcelona. I know, I don't know if Ian can comment that, but I've seen Dembele has been mentioned, uh, um, Coutinho. Um, I think my thoughts are similar to Ian. Like, honestly, like at this point, like we just need to survive because like at this point, our, our club isn't good enough besides, you know, like a few players on our team. Like we, we just need to improve and we need to find a manager. We'll see. Like, I know a few guys have been mentioned. Um, I know, uh, Former Borussia Dortmund manager to mention Favre, he would be wouldn't be bad, but we'll see. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, in the summer there's potential that we'll sign if we if we stay up, we'll sign maybe one kind of bigger name player that everyone kind of knows and like okay, it's a big signing. I think in January, I think what we'll look to do is try and raid other Premier League clubs that are like in the bottom half, improving really- us and and weakening them. Right. So, like, I think we'll go, like, you know, even to, like, Brighton and go take Lamptey with old Chelsea player, you know, for our right back. You know, those kind of players. We'll go, you know, you know, take off a centre-back from Burnley, take off a centre-back from Wolves, that kind of stuff. We'll right. go and get, you know, Connor Cody from Wolves. That kind of, I think those are the kind of players that will go and then maybe go to, like, the bigger clubs like Manchester United and take away a couple of players or one player that isn't starting and is a bit upset who just needs to leave and will just take the money you know, because they need it. Um, so I think that's what the target is, will go, because we just need to improve the team. And if we're weakening of the teams around us at the same time, that's also kind of good for us right now. So. Yeah, and, and that's, I guess, like the, the right strategy, right? You can't just have all big name players. You do need some of the guys that um, come in for like, not the big transfer fees, but put in the work. Like, like you mentioned, I love the name Tarek Lamptey. Uh, we saw him at Chelsea and we've seen him go to Brighton and do good things. And he definitely has a bright future. So uh, bringing in players of that caliber and that character would definitely help Newcastle, you know, come out of this uh, relegation fight. Um, and then I, I, I love the guy. I love the fact that you guys aren't always saying, let's just go get the big player. Now it's like, let's build they, for they, it. They wouldn't come. <laughs> like if you're a big player right now, you wouldn't come. So you might be able to agree like a fee with, a Barcelona player right. or a Juventus player or a whoever, a Bayern Munich player, but they're not going to sign a contract because they, they don't know. They, right. they don't know what's money. happening. Right. Yeah. Like you can get those like pay for like, you know, money players who just don't care, but we don't need that. Don't yeah. You don't need that. We don't need it. So it's better yeah. to go get the experience, especially probably like Premier League, stand, Premier League experience players. You know, like even like a like, uh, award, you know, award price from right. from Southampton or a star from from Watford. Those kind of players that have played in the Premier League, and you can go spend some money on them, yes, but they're not like necessarily superstar names unless you watch the Premier League. But they're still going to improve us. So, and then in the summer, then the changes, and then the next summer it changes again, and then it, it builds up from there. And I'm sure there will be in the summer you can get people for free. That's also right. you know, those people that the contract are up and you can go okay well we can offer you a lot of money on your on your wages because we haven't paid anything for you um so yeah we'll see we can spend a lot of money in the end we can spend a lot of money in newcastle a profitable club we haven't made a loss apart from covid we can go out and spend 200 million every year and still without without any new sponsorship deals from saudi arabia we can yeah. still spend 200 million a season and not get into financial problems with the Premier League because we'll spread that money. It's not like when you spend 200 million on players, you're not really spending 200 million like up front. Right. You're it's spreading over it over five years. So, really, when you're spending 200 million, you may be only spending 120. And then you were also making money from selling players on and, and our sponsorship deals and, and, and so forth and so on. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they spend a hundred million in January and then do it all again in the summer. And, and I guess that's that credit to maybe Mike Ashley for, for keeping the, the club in a position that at least benefited him, but now benefits Newcastle and the new ownership group. So well, what he did, I think what he did in the end, it wasn't a 
good way to run a football club to win anything, right. but it was a good way to run a football club to make it something that was easy to sell. Right. And, and, and like, you know, because if Newcastle was run in a different way, some of the club would have been bought today. So, um, yeah, so like in the end, he, he, I don't think he was going to keep the club for very long anyway. He bought the club, I think, to have it and flip it. Right. And it didn't go very well at the beginning. We got relegated and then the flip doesn't happen. And then now he's kind of stuck. So he's trying to not spend as much money because every money he spends is costing him less money when he flips it. So I think he, he, I think he, he was the idea like, I'm going to keep it for five years, stay in the Premier League, get some players, flip it make a hundred million and go, you know, buy another supermarket or whatever, <laughs> you know, and that just didn't happen for him. And, and then he was stuck with it, you know? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But exciting times for you guys. And, and, you know, Jackie and I kind of went through something similar. You could say a, a lot of years ago with when Roman Abramovich came in. Um, so wishing you guys all the best and all the success that comes with it. Uh, and we'll definitely be watching and with the keen eye to see who you get around uh, in terms of players. And hopefully you don't come around to our club uh, to pick up some of our guys. But uh, let's move on to the game, which is coming up this weekend. It's Newcastle against Chelsea. Ian, you touched on it. Uh, it is the 10 a.m. kickoff here on the East Coast uh, in, in the U.S. And it's a game for Jackie and I where a couple of weeks ago we would have said, no, I think we win it. But... We just don't know what to expect. Uh, Newcastle came out firing against Spurs in that first game. Uh, and, you know, we got a draw last weekend against Crystal Palace. Uh, so it's, I, I can't predict it. I don't know what to expect. I, I would say we would win. But uh, before we get into any predictions, anything, just touching on Newcastle's, like you guys have mentioned, nine games played, no wins so far, four draws and five defeats. Um, most recently drew with Palace, like I mentioned, Chelsea, on the other hand, nine games, seven wins, one draw, one defeat, uh, sitting in first place. So almost top of the table versus bottom of the table. But we know uh, with Newcastle at home, the atmosphere is going to be rocking and anything can happen in the Premier League. So uh, let's get into a slight quiz we have prepared for you guys. Uh, it'll be Ian and Noah from Newcastle uh, going up against Jackie here from the Chelsea side. Uh, so the way it works is I will read out the questions, give you a couple of options. You guys pick a, pick the right answer. And if it's right, uh, you get a point. If not, we move on to the next one. So I have four questions each uh, for each side. I'll go Newcastle first, Chelsea, and back and forth like that. So starting with um, Newcastle, the last time Newcastle beat Chelsea was in January of 2020. Who scored the only goal in the 94th minute? Was it Miguel hey, Al? Oh. 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 <laughs> hey, Hayden. Oh, I don't even need that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see. We don't win very many games. If you're talking about win. If you're talking about who, when, when we win, that's easy. That one. You should have said when the last time we lost. <laughs> <for Chelsea. laughs> well, Isaac Hayden is the right answer. It came right at the end in the 94th minute. Like I mentioned, uh, Frank Lampard was our manager back then, and um, it was heartbreaking to see us lose that game, but. You guys won it fair and square, so um, maybe know where you can do the next one. But before you, I come to you, I, I got to go to Jackie. So, Jackie, the last time we played Newcastle away at St. James's Park was November of last year. Okay. Chelsea won 2 0 with an own goal from Federico Fernandez, who scored the second goal for Chelsea. And I'll read out the options unless you want to pull an E in here. No, Ian uh, yeah. was very, very brilliant with that answer. I, I don't have that capacity, so <laughs> let me know the options. <laughs> Uh, so the first option is Timo Werner. The second option is Tammy Abraham. Uh, third option is Olivier Giroud. And the last is Hakim Ziyech. Honestly, I haven't got a clue. So I'm <laughs> going to have to take a, a wild guess here and I'm going to go with uh, Olivier Giroud. That is actually wrong. It was Tammy Abraham. Okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, Tammy Abraham scored the second goal in a 2 0 win, uh, which actually put us top of the table back then in November. So, uh, things were looking pretty good for us and Frank Lampard, but we know how that turned out. Um, so Noah, coming to you, and, and Ian, you can obviously jump in too if, if you want to. Uh, but in 2005, this Englishman moved from Chelsea to Newcastle for 6.5 million pounds. Who is this player? Is it Joe Cole, Sean Wright Phillips, Wayne Bridge, or Scott Parker? 
Scott Parker. There you go. That is that is right. He moved uh, from Chelsea to Newcastle, and uh, it was right around the time Mourinho and Obramovich had come in, so he had limited time, and he moved across to Newcastle. So that's two right answers for the Newcastle side, Jackie. You've got to pick up your game here. I do. Uh, so in two thousand in January of two thousand thirteen, we the Chelsea signed a player from Newcastle. Uh, who is this player? Is it Pepe Cisse, Danny Simpson, Johan Kabai, or Demba Ba? I think I remember this one because of the famous Gerard slip, but I'm <laughs> pretty sure it's Demba Ba that we signed from Newcastle. That is right. And it's 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 funny because every time you mention Demba Ba and Chelsea in the same sentence, you end up talking about that Gerard slip. Uh, and it's, it's just an iconic moment. And I think Demba Ba came out earlier uh, this year and said something about it too when he said kind of doesn't feel bad for doing it because it happened, but um, it is what it is. So right. that's two, one after two questions each, we now come back to the Newcastle boys. Uh, who was the player to score both goals in a two nil win for Newcastle at Stamford bridge in May of 2012. And I see Ian already nodding. I already his head. Know too. I know <laughs> so I maybe you got really one of, goal. one of you can say the first name and the other one could say the last name, but I will read out <laughs> the options. The first name, Ian. Huh? Did Jibro? You say you say. say. Yeah. See <laughs> say. See say. Papi see say. That is right. And that second goal, which was defied all laws of physics, and I still don't know how we conceded it, but it was pretty much from the corner, I, I believe, like the the wing, and it just bent all the way over Czech's head and right outside and, the box. Yeah, yeah, and that I, I haven't seen a goal like that in, since then. So. And I don't think we will, but Papi Cisse is the right answer. So that's 3-1. Uh, Jackie, here's your next question. Uh, in 2015, we were struggling uh, with Mourinho. We went away to Newcastle, drew 2-2. Two, two. two Brazilians scored for Chelsea. One of them was William. Who was the other one? David Luiz, Ramirez, Oscar, or Lucas Piazzo? I honestly forgot that we had that many Brazilians in our squad <laughs> at that time. So... Uh, again, shot in the dark. I'm going to have to go with Ramirez for this one. And that is right. Ramirez scored the first and then William scored the second to make it 2-2. And we got a point out of that game that day. Uh, let's go to the fourth question here. And that is for um, Ian and Noah. How many Premier League goals has Callum Wilson scored this season? Is it five, three, two, or four? Four. Four. Four is the right answer. He scored against West Ham, Southampton, Spurs, and most recently against Palace. So that's all four questions, right? Which means they won it, Jackie, but I will read out the fourth question for you. <laughs> uh, and hopefully you can uh, get a, a consolation goal over here. Safe face. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the last goal, uh, last question for you, Jackie, is how many Premier League goals has Lukaku scored for Chelsea this season? Is it three, four, five, or six? In the Premier League. In the Premier League. I'm going to say three. Three is the right answer. He scored against Arsenal on his debut and then twice against Villa. Right. So it ends 4-3. The Newcastle boys win. And if that's kind of an indication for the game to come, <laughs> we're in for a cracker. Uh, we'll probably be, we'll definitely be sad, but you guys will be, will be happy. And, and maybe Graham Jones will get hired full time. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he wins 5-0, I don't think he'll be hired. <laughs> but let's come back to the game, guys. So in terms of predictions, starting a lineup, um, I'll let you guys maybe share your thoughts on Newcastle and who you think will start. And, and Jackie and I can kind of run through who we think plays for Chelsea. I think Newcastle is going to pretty much stay the, the same as what we've been doing the last pretty much for the whole season. So... We're going to play um, probably three at the back with wing backs. Um, it's, the thing is about us right now is I don't think we're going to do anything kind of out of the out of the box or out of the blue. You're going to have center midfield. You're going to have Hayden. You're going to have uh, Willock. Um, you're going to have probably Longstaff in there. Um, and then on the wing, St. Maximum. And then, well, up front, actually, we've been playing like two. So like Wilson and St. Maximum up front, but they're kind of um, with, Say maximum floating a little bit behind, but 
in the end, he, we just have to play to to stay in the game and then obviously counter. That's kind of what we've been doing this season so far. We don't have enough creativity in the middle of the park to kind of break anyone down unless it's on like a quick counterattack. So, but Newcastle are like that. We will lose to Norwich and we'll go and beat Man City. And that's kind of what we've always been like the last two years. So you just never know um, with what we do I think if we just have a good performance and improve every game, you know, we have every chance. And anyone in the Premier League can be anybody in the Premier League. Um, there's just more chance Chelsea win at the weekend. But no, we can definitely come out, especially if, if you know, St. Maxman and Wilson are on top form, they can score against anyone in the league. So um, uh, as long as we're solid defensively, I think, we you know, it's going to be a tough game for both teams. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, like you said, Wilson and Maximum have been in good form, right? They've probably been your, one of or two of your best players this season with the goals and the assist. And every time St. Maximum picks up that ball, you know something's going to happen, uh, good or bad, in terms of um, he's lost the possession a few times too. But that's that's the you know the creativity of, of that player. Uh, Noah, your thoughts on, on the 11? And uh, maybe you could start us off with the score prediction from your side. Okay. Well, I mean, I more or less agree with Ian. Uh, I think that um, my biggest concern, at least with Newcastle, is just our defense. We've, we've, I think we've given up the most goals the entire season in Premier League. So, I mean, I think we're really just going to more or less do what we've done all year, stay three in the back. The wing backs will, you know, I'm, and more or less, you know, play five more or less against Chelsea because you guys are just going to control the ball and just try and get, get you know, get lucky on the, on the counterattack and hope that, St. Maximin and uh, Cal Moser are able to create a goal. Um, regarding my prediction, um, I think I think Newcastle will keep it close for a half. I think it'll be like 1-0, 1-1 at halftime, but I think Chelsea will pull ahead in the second half and win uh, 3-1. That's my prediction. That's, that's, I mean, it's it's interesting that, you know, Newcastle pretty much played this similar system to us, at least with the three uh, defenders and the wingbacks. Uh, and usually when teams have matched us, we've, we've, at least from the Chelsea side, found it difficult to break teams. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that plays out. Uh, Ian, from your side, score prediction? I think it's going to be Hayden in the 94th minute. <laughs> <laughs> the no, I, I, I think it depends. I think if we go down a goal, we lose. Um, I think if it's second half and we're still a draw, I think will win I think it'll be one it'll either be one nil to Newcastle um or we'll like we'll lose three one or something like that but um I think if it stays tight I think if we get into like the 60th minute and we go goal up or something like that we'll just we'll just park the bus yeah and then Chelsea will get frustrated and it'll, it'll be hard for, for them and then at that point you'll start attacking and we may get another goal but I think it's just the case of it has to get to that point, and to get to that point, it's not exactly easy to get to that point, um, especially against a team like Chelsea right now. So, uh, but we'll see. I think yeah, if Chelsea go a goal up, uh, especially early, I think the, the game will be dangerous for Newcastle because we'll have to then start attacking and leaving our uh, pretty poor <laughs> defensive t players right now um, in a lot of trouble. That's fair enough, Jackie. How about from our side? I, I mean. Mendy and goal back three kind of picks itself with Rudiger, Silva, Espelicueta. Uh, I think our biggest issue here is who we play up front with no strikers around. Uh, and I think that kind of plays into with Newcastle's favor because uh, we have Kai Havertz who's been playing that role, but uh, coming up against uh, away, especially to Newcastle um, team that's trying to prove something that could be a, 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 an area where we maybe lose the game or drop some points. Yeah, you know, you said it perfectly. I think Kai Havertz, even though he's the only one that can play up top, does tend to struggle when teams are physical with him. So, yes, Newcastle doesn't have the best defensive record in the league, but if they can bully him a little bit or push him around, we're effectively playing without a central focal point. Now, Chelsea have done well with a false nine, so they can move things around. But again, it's, it's just like the two gentlemen touched on. If they can really hold on for that first half, it gets a little bit difficult. And look... We're playing at Newcastle. We know the stadium is loud. It's proud. It's exciting. And, and I've noticed that the Chelsea front line, when it's not going their way, they tend to shy away from goals. So I think that's Newcastle's biggest strength is definitely going uh, go that first half without conceding a goal. And then from there, 
anything can happen. So really, as far as that that game plays, it's really going to come down to that first half, and then we watch what happens. As far as, as a prediction, I'm still very confident in our team overall, so I think we can get a 2 nail. but again, it really depends on getting a goal in that first half. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and there's one player that I, you know, I'd like to bring Ian and Noah in on too, because we all, we all live here in the U.S., and that's Christian Pulisic, who hasn't really featured much for Chelsea. He played one game, which was the first game this season, and then been kind of injured with COVID and, and just not gone for him. Finally, he's back in training. Uh, but at least fans in the U.S., you guys obviously don't support Chelsea, but, you know, as fans of the game in the U.S., uh, your thoughts on Pulisic and, and you know, how far can he go and, and what can he achieve uh, at Chelsea and beyond? I think with Pulisic, he has every ability to kind of do whatever he wants to do in the game. It just depends if he, like a lot of players, if he reaches the potential that, you know, he needs to do. I think consistency, what I've seen with Pulisic, I don't watch as many Chelsea games as you guys watch Chelsea games, but... I think he's always in and out of the team, regardless of illness or sickness or whatever. Because right. I don't think whatever manager he's been under, he's, he's they don't trust that he's just going to be. They don't know what, exactly what they're going to get from him. So, um, yeah, he's, he's a quality player. But sometimes a player that is not as good but is consistent will play more. So it just depends on, you know, if if the manager likes him, he'll do well. If new managers come in and don't like him, he'll he'll struggle. So, um, but yeah, man, he's a good player. Just uh, we'll have him. <laughs> if you don't need him, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then Noah, your thoughts on, on Pulisic? Well, I mean, I'll be honest, like my thoughts on Pulisic are primarily based on watching the U.S. men's national team because I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of that team. Yeah. I mean, he, I, I agree with you, and I think he can play it. Like, I just think of him as consistency. I mean, if the U.S. men's national team, I think, like, he's been hurt. Like he hasn't been playing as much, obviously. So I think he's had to have some. He's had some health issues, but I think of him as just consistency and just getting on the right team. I I think he can play. He has so much potential. He's yeah, United, States, United States first like guy who I can I think can like really play on any you know any side if he, you know if he's in the right right state of mind. I think for me actually, do you know, he little bit reminds me of not as a player, but as his like injury problems is like a Callum Wilson. Callum Wilson is a top quality striker. If he was fit all season for every single team he played for, he already scored, like he said, he scored, he scored four goals a season in six games. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So he, he'll score, he would score a lot of goals for any club if he was fit. And Paul Six the same. It's just he's not, he doesn't play enough. So, because he's injured. And players are always like that, you know. There's always some players, but that's that's kind of thing. If, you know, if they can stay fit, but if they're injury prone, it's just they'll never get there. Because by the time that they they get older every year, and by the time you get older, sometimes then you get older, and then the more injuries you get, you have to change your game. And then when he loses a bit of his pace, that's kind of a key thing for him. And then he has to change his game. So he just needs to sort out, I think, his injury problems, and then he'll push on from there. If he doesn't sort these injury problems out, he's always going to be in a good team, but never that guy that you're going to put every game and rely on to win you the Champions League, you know, or whatever it might be. Yeah, and, and that's very good analysis from, from both of you on him. For us, we've we watched him, we've supported him, we wanted him to play a lot more. And like you said, Ian, for some reason or the other, even when he is fit, he's kind of in and out of the team. And that could be down to just the managers managing his fitness and his injuries and his playtime. But um, he is back, and I brought him up because I think – for my score prediction, he is going to make a difference. He is going to come off that bench, hopefully, and 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 make a difference. Uh, because I do think Newcastle will make it tight. They will hold on, like you guys were saying, till the 60, 65th minute. Uh, but our quality from the bench, and no, no disrespect to Newcastle, I think our quality from the bench will make the difference. And uh, I think we'll win it 1-0, uh, which means it will be extremely tight. But um, Kulusik might be that difference maker. So... I'm, I'm pre- keeping my fingers crossed for him to make a, an Im- instant impact when he comes on. Uh, but it should be a fun game and um, wishing you guys the best for it and for the rest of the season. Uh, Jackie, anything to add before we kind of wrap it up? No, look, I think it's going to be an exciting game. I always think watching any game at Newcastle is always going to be exciting. One of the best fan bases in the world, clearly. And, you know, I know that you guys have broken down some of the things Mike Ashley has done financially to help you get acquired. But I think just the fanfare and the support that 
Newcastle as a club bring definitely has revenue associated with it. So that alone is a big deal. I'm excited to watch the game and best of luck to both of you guys as well. And if you guys are ever up in, I am, I'm in Connecticut. So if you're ever in the area or in, in Houston for Jackie, definitely hit us up and we can get together and, and watch a game. Uh, and um, that wraps it up guys. Thank you very much for joining Ian uh, Noah from Toon Army Miami. Like we said, check them out on um, you guys are on Instagram. Facebook, Twitter, yeah, on Instagram, Instagram, all that fun stuff. Yep. So check them out, drop them a follow. Um, and like Ian said, it should be an exciting game. Like Noah said, it should be a, a good upcoming future for the, for the club of Newcastle. And Jackie and I will kind of touch on uh, our Carabao Cup game right after this. So, so stay tuned, but thank you guys for, uh, for joining and, and good luck. Thank you guys. Yeah. Have a good, uh, have a good weekend. You too. Not Take that care. good, but have a good weekend. <laughs> Besides the Newcastle match. <laughs> exactly. Take Thank care, you. guys. Bye. Bye. All right, Rahul. Should we get back into the Carabao Cup review now that we just went through? Yes, the Kepa show. Is that what we're calling it now? <laughs> <laughs> So why don't you take us through the starting lineup to play the game? Yeah, so like I said, Kepa started, uh, Trevor Chaloba started in that mid, uh, central mid, no, yeah. central defensive uh, position where usually Christensen or uh, Tiago Silva play. I think Christensen picked up a, a facial injury or something right before, uh, the day before, so he missed out. Reese James comes back in mm -hmm. as our right-sided center back. And Malung Sar, like we had predicted, gets the game again at, at that left center back position. Hudson Adoy filling in at the right wing back. Yep. Uh, he's kind of back into the position where he started under Tuchel. Kovacic and Saul uh, in midfield. Marcus Alonso, captain for the night on the left wing back. Hakim Ziyech, Ross Barkley, and Kai Havertz. Yeah, and I was interested to see Ross Barkley. I think I actually called that he was going to start that game. He's one of those players that I, in the beginning of the season, I didn't think he was going to hang around, but either due to no loan or we have a lot of games this season, he ends up hanging around. So good to see him on there. And another one is Callum hudson Adoy. I know we've talked about him wanting more game time. He's not always going to get in this preferred position. So I think it's interesting that he did get to play at right wing back and maybe show what he can do over there. Yeah, and I mean, I personally prefer him playing in that left wing position yep. where he eventually moved up in, in this game. But, uh, you know, right wing back is, is an option for him and he has done well in it when, like I said, when Tuchel first came in, but uh, first half, we were doing pretty well. Southampton came out with the plan and, and that was to press us high. They kind of matched us in terms of formation with the back three with two wing backs uh, and, they made it difficult for us, but we did have our chances. And one player that we do have to talk about who eventually gets the goal is Kai Havertz. Uh, he may have listened to our last episode and, and decided to show us what he really is capable of because this was a whole different player in this, in this game. I was going to say we don't need to talk about Kai Havertz because <laughs> I criticized him in the previous episode and here he shows up trying to get a goal. And, and from a header of all things, look, I know Kai is a tall guy and he can definitely get on the end of headers. But I think it's the fact that he performed the way you're talking about, which is a little more energy, a little more zestiness to a play, a little more aggressiveness to the play, which is what we pretty much, you know, criticized him for before this particular game. So maybe he's listening, maybe Tuchel's listening. Maybe it's one of those things where he looks internally and says, these are the things I need to improve on because we as fans are seeing it. And he steps up his game and, and he's rewarded for it. And that's great to see. Yeah, you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. It wasn't just, you know, his goal was excellent. He, he leaps the highest and gets the goal in that 44th minute. But leading up to that, he was one of our biggest threats to get a goal. Mm -hmm. He was making runs from deep. He was actually tracking back and helping with the defensive side of the game. Yep. And it's complete 180 from what we've seen from him for the last few weeks where he gives away the ball pretty easily right. or, or isn't physical enough, like you were saying. So maybe Tuchel's had a word with him or maybe it's just our criticism that's gotten to him uh, but whatever it is please continue because like we said with Ian and Noah he is he is our only option in, in strike for this Newcastle game so uh, having him feeling good and in, in form is is definitely helpful yeah and I think that's key whatever is causing him to 
for lack of a better word, wake up. I think that's what he needs to continue doing, whether it's Tuchel screaming, whether he's looking internally, whether the fans are making noise on the internet. It doesn't matter. I think he as a player needs to just continue with his form and continue with his energy. We have to rely on him for at least two or three more weeks based on some of the feedback that's coming out of the camp, which I'm not upset about at the end of the day. I think that if a player deserves their chance, they deserve their chance. Now's your time to take it. And so if this is one of the games he can take it in, why not? Just keep going for it. I agree. And the other player we've got to talk about is Saul in midfield mm-hmm. here. He's come in on loan. We've spoken about it and made his debut and wasn't that good. Got taken off right. at halftime, made a, a second appearance with Chelsea in the Carabao Cup against Villa. Okay. But I think this third game is where we saw glimpses or or at least certain moments of, of a player that we know has the potential and uh, did pretty well in, in that midfield. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think he did very well in that midfield. And typically we look at the Carabao Cup and say lesser opposition, it's going to be an easier game. But Southampton were no you know, walk in the park. They came prepared. Mm-hmm. And I think in the previous episode, I had stated that this is a fresh start. You're not looking at your Premier League form. You're not looking at the results. You're just here to win a cup game. And so they came with no fear. They played really, really well. They pressed us really, really well. And of course, we'll talk about the result in a few minutes. But the point I'm trying to make is that it was a tough game for Saul, and he really stood up to the challenge. He did, and he had a bunch of headers on goals on the, yeah. on the attacking side where he could have gotten himself a goal. So it was good to see, and I know we had expected Loftus Street to start. He picked up a knock, I believe, in that Norwich game, actually. That's why he missed out. Uh, but it was an opportunity, like you said, with um, Havertz, like you said, with Hudson Adoy, an opportunity for Saul, and I think he he definitely threw his hat his name into that hat for those midfield positions. So uh, it's good to have players in form that can always step in. Uh, and then there's one more player that I would love to talk about here is, is Chaloba. Mm-hmm. And we've heaped praise on this young man. We've spoken about an evolution basically that's happened uh, over preseason and continued into this season. And it continued into this game where he played that central uh, center back position and looked very comfortable. And I, I want to say he's now played pretty much across that back three in every position. Yeah, and the risk of repeating myself, I think that's that's exciting because you talk about Thiago Silva, that's 36 now, and I hope he plays for another two, three years, but you know that's never going to be the case with age catching up. And of course, with Chaloba putting pressure on his shoulders, you talk about Rudiger that potentially may not sign a contract because he's looking for bigger wages. And so it's refreshing to see Chaloba step into that right wing, not right wing back, but right center back position, that center, middle center back position, and maybe even the left back center back position. And, and he's making it his own. He's not making mistakes. He looks confident. Tuchel really has a headache on his hands. And it's a good headache, Rahul, because it's do I continue to appease the youth and let Chaloba play more and more and more? Or do I just say, hey, look, you've proven to me what you can do. Just take your time, buy, you know, bide your time. You know, in the next six months, maybe even next season, you might become the first team center back. Whichever position you end up playing, you might end up becoming one of the first choices for me. Yeah, and I, I think Tuchel's done a good job with man management, with keeping players on side, like they say, uh, you know, just letting people know when they're going to be playing, when they're not going to be playing, and why. Uh, and I think he's done exceptionally well with, with Chaloba, with Malang Sar, and some of the other younger guys that are coming through. Uh, you brought up, and I don't want to go off top topic yet, but you brought up the contract situation with Rudiger and Christensen, so well, let's come back to that. Uh, but the second half comes around and we do concede a goal and it's 1-1. Um, and we kind of an easy goal to give up, you'd say? Yeah. It, it, those are the things that I think we lack a little bit of concentration in. It was very early on in that second half as well, where we come back. And, and I know Tuchel's come with a message. And, and I can only assume the message is do more of the same. We weren't horrible in that first half. We weren't necessarily controlling the game per se. Right. But we were good. And it's one of those things where we come back and I think either we lose focus or someone's not paying attention for a split second. And those are the things that not, I don't want to criticize this game too heavily, but those are the things in the season overall where I've said, sometimes it's a game of two halves where a split split second of not paying attention gets you into hot water. Yeah. And, and that's what happened. That's, that's the quality of the opposition and the quality of um, this competition where you can be punished and, and we were punished and, uh, one nil coming into the second half turns into one one and Southampton honestly did turn it up a little bit in that second yeah. half and had their opportunities where 
we had to rely on Kepa and he came up big and we will touch on him as we, as we, as we move forward. But um, he did well. I think we, we held off uh, the Southampton pressure and ourselves went ahead and tried to make some uh, positive impacts on the other side. Mason Mount came on, Chilwell came on. Um, I'm forgetting who else came on, but those were the two that came on. And it was interesting because Chilwell came on and played right wing back because yeah. we moved Hudson Adoy to to left wing. And um, is that something that you know, if, if it comes down to it, we may end up seeing Chilwell and Alonso be in the same game? It's possible. I, I don't know if that's going to happen a lot. I think maybe with injuries that may happen during the season or. Aspilicueta is 33 going on 34. So not saying he can't play many games, but to balance the team out, Reese can play that right center back position as, we, as we've seen. And, and, you know, Chilwell didn't do terribly. I, I, he's, he's natively looking for the left side of the pitch. So you see him coming in quite a bit, but he didn't do so bad. So I think that's something we'll see more and more of. I think what I want to talk about for a few minutes, maybe not too much off topic is Ross Barkley and Hakim Ziyech. I think, both are good players. Both have proven on instances, maybe that's the right word, proven on instances that they can unlock a game and perform well. These are games that I'm expecting them both to step up in. And, and again, we criticized Kai Havertz in the previous game, so I'm not here saying let's criticize them to the fullest, but I expected a little bit more of them. And the fact that those two who don't get the most game time were pulled off maybe is a sign that Tuchel's giving a message or saying the same things we are noticing is you need to step up to another level now. And you're right. He said that already for, for Hakim Ziyech, where we touched on it, I think, an episode or two ago, that he came back from injury. He, he's fit, but he feels like he's still holding back a little bit. Uh, and even though he gets an assist in this game for the Kai Havertz goal, there wasn't that much more that you could say, all right, I, you know, this is why I see Hakim Ziyech should be in the starting 11 in the Premier League or the Champions League. He's turning into a squad player. And not a bad squad player to have, of don't, course, don't get no. me wrong, but uh, you want to see a little bit more from him. You know what he's capable of. You know we've seen it with Ajax, and we've seen glimpses of it with Chelsea, but yep. for some reason or the other, it's just not happening. And it could be just the system that we're playing. I think he flourished a little more on the Lampard. Uh, his best game on the Tuchel, I'd say, would be in that FA Cup semifinal when we beat um, Man City. Man City, yeah. And so it, it just simply could be down to him just not being you know and good in this system and that's fine but when you look at some of the other players and we touched on Pulisic earlier he's coming back when Lukaku and Timo Werner are coming back and that just pushes the egg further down and for him that's got to be disheartening because you want to be playing all the time and Ross Barkley like you said I think a lone move should have happened it didn't and he's getting the time, but I think eventually he knows deep down that his future lies away from Chelsea. And, and sometimes you see that in, in the performances. Yeah, and, and not so much about Ziyech, but with Ross Barkley, if your future lies away from Chelsea, you're going to want to take these opportunities to almost put yourself on display, playing for a loan move or playing for a transfer where you're hoping somebody will see the value in you. And, I, and again, I do see the value in Ross Barkley. I think he's one of those players that on his day and in specific instances can be a key to unlock any defense. He did it a few weeks against Southampton, actually, right. <laughs> which is where you hope that, you know, they can they can show their true colors and their true value. But again, I don't want to criticize too heavily. Southampton were very good. They were very tight, uh, very opposite to Norwich, who were almost loose and fluid. So it's good that they learn from that and kind of take, take those options and move forward. Yeah, and... Uh... I mean, it comes down to penalties again, and we can we can touch to touch on that. And it's at that point you're thinking, okay, we've won two already this season. Could we do a third one? And and surely we did, but we're leaving it a lot up to luck in the Carabao Cup. And I know it may not be one of the top priorities, but we keep making it further on. We won our third penalty shootout, two in the Carabao Cup, uh, and we're now in the quarterfinals. We you know, the further you get, the more serious it gets. And the question I have for you is, can we keep relying on our luck? Or at some at some point, we're just going to have to go for and kill a game in this competition, at least. The way you asked the question is actually very brilliant, because I think that, yes, we can rely on our luck in this competition, because this competition, while I as a Chelsea fan and many Chelsea fans want to win it, because I love winning and I love seeing Chelsea lift the trophy, 
it's not necessarily the priority of the season and, and the highest priority trophy that I'd like to win. We've been using the Carabao Cup, especially over the last, I want to say, five, six seasons to, to rotate team players, to give some of the other players a chance to see some youth come through. But I always go back to one of our first seasons when the Carabao Cup was the Carling Cup. And Mourinho said, it's a chance to win silverware very early, very early on in the season and set the tone set the expectation, almost change the mentality of this is a winning club. So the way you ask the question is a very smart way because yes, we can keep riding our luck, but at the same time, I want to see us win games and kill games because I want to set that expectation. We've won something. I think the, the final is somewhere in January or February, win it then. And it sets the season towards that final stage of the, of the year where it's you're now in the champions league. You're now in the FA cup. You're towards the end of the premier league. You've already won something the confidence continues to grow. And that's really the way I see it. And, and that's a great point. And I, let's touch on the penalties, but let's table that point because I want to bring that point up again when we talk about Man City. Right. Uh, so for our penalties, it was Kepa making a save off of uh, Theo Walcott, which put us in the game. Mason Mount comes up and misses. So that's 1-1. We had scored the first one through Alonso. Uh, Mason Mount missed. And then Hudson Adoy stepped up, scored, which put us in the driving seat. Uh, I can't remember specifically who scored for Southampton again, but they did end up missing one more through uh, mm-hmm. Smallbone. And I personally didn't know who he was until this game, but from everything I've read and seen, he came back from a long-term injury, he torn his ACL. This was mm-hmm. his, one of his first games back. And for him to step up and say, I'm going to take this penalty, credit to him. He did end up missing. Um, Chilwell stepped up and, and put us in the driving seat and then Beast James, or our penalty kick taker that we didn't know we had until this competition <laughs> steps up again, takes the fifth penalty and, and wins us the game. Yeah. And look, I think it's one of those things where penalties can go either way and, and no shame to Southampton. I think they did really well. Will, Will Smallbone, you've got to give the guy credit. I think that's one thing I took away from it was you come back from a long injury. I think overall he's a really young player as he well. Is. I think he's 23, something like that. And so just to have the confidence and come up and, and try, yes, it was not a good penalty. Yes, we got lucky with that situation. But overall, a, a good situation. And Reese James, good penalty. Ben Chilwell, again, another guy that's hot on form, taking penalties. Marcus Alonso. I mean, the list goes on. And some of these players, excuse me, that we've talked about that are scoring in these games, it's good to see that we do have a reliable team of penalty takers, especially given back to your point, we may ride our luck for the next few few games over here. Yeah, and you know, the biggest thing I'm taking out of this is in the last two penalty kicks, most of our defenders have stepped up and scored. Right. So maybe when it comes down to the, the business end of it, or I guess when we're further into the competition, we have our regular penalty kick takers that can step up and, and throw the other goalkeeper off because he's prepared for defenders. So it's, it's good to see, and it's all fun and games when you win. Obviously, if we'd lost, we'd be saying, why is our defender stepping up? <laughs> um, but hey, they've got the confidence and they're taking good penalties and we make it through the the next round. Uh, And coming back to Man City and and the point that you were making about winning this competition and setting yourself up for the rest of the season, they went out for the first time in five years Mm -hmm. of this competition. I think it was after 1,800 days or something like that, which is ridiculous because you think of Man City and comparatively their, their same stature, same goals and ambitions as Chelsea. But they've taken this competition seriously every season under Pep. They've said, this is what we want to win. Like you were saying, and Mourinho said, this sets us up for the rest of the season. And credit to them, what credit to West Ham, who knocked them out finally. Um, And so going back to your point about Chelsea, yes, it's not the priority, but I'd love to see Tuchel and the boys go and and win this competition because then it it adds to that Champions League. It says, okay, now we won a second trophy. The right. players buy into it a little more, I guess, third trophy because we won the Super Cup. Uh, we, the players buy into his philosophy, his ideas, and, and sets you up for the rest of the season, like you were saying. Yeah, uh, and you know, you players like, you talk about Kepa, right, Rahul? He had a, a rough year under Lampard, and, you know, Tuchel's come in, and obviously he's not had the opportunity as much as he would like to. But these are the games that I, I love to see Kepa shine in because at the end of the day, we've already talked about this. Mendy will go away for the African Cup of Nations. And so as much opportunity, as much game time, as much confidence Kepa can get in these, it's going to come valuable come January when he's gone. Uh, Mendy, I mean, when he's gone for African Cup of Nations. And it was, 
it was a funny little moment to see Kepa walk up to their first penalty taker, which I believe was Armstrong. And, and you know he doesn't need the ball, but Kepa's like, can I see the ball? Can I see the ball? And Armstrong's like, you don't need to see the ball. He's like, can I see the ball? And he stands in front of him and bounces and bounces, almost playing the mind games. And those are the things I like to see is that Kepa's confident enough to say, I'm going to save one or two here. Let me start by putting myself in your head here before you take your spot kick. So good to see. And those are things that I want to continue to see, not just from Kepa, but those second string of players that are pushing for a first starting spot. That's spot on. And I guess we didn't even touch on Kepa because we touched on pretty much everyone in the team. Uh, so just on the Kepa team, I think a year ago, we had written him off. We had said we've agreed 70 million player. We, you know, why did we pay all of that? But he's gone away. Like we said, he should go away, take the time off the pitch, let Mendy take over, become the star or, or, or the, the main guy in terms of the news and the media. And Kepa has slowly worked his way back with clean sheets in the FA Cup last season with a couple of appearances in the Premier League. And now he's come back and won the Super Cup. He's won two consecutive penalty shootouts in the Carabao Cup. That's a great turnaround and shows you his mindset and his determination to say, what was going on a year ago wasn't the real Kepa. The real Kepa is what you guys are going to see. And, and I, I was concerned about Mendy going away to the African Cup of Nations, which, by the way, may get canceled. But if he does end up going away, I'm comfortable with Kepa being in there. Yes, he conceded a silly goal, right. but he's redeemed himself throughout that game. So uh, I'm happy for him, and I'm happy that he is – earning his his chances and, and his way back into the squad. But coming back to West Ham and Man City, Man City are out. West Ham have knocked a second Manchester club out of the Carabao Cup this season. So they've got to be feared. Uh, Liverpool went ahead and beat Preston 2-0. So they're into the next round as well. Sunderland beat QPR on penalties. They're into the next round. Brentford are in the next round and, and they're slowly making their way into this competition. Leicester City beat Brighton on penalties and Tottenham beat Burnley 1-0. So still some good teams around in the quarterfinals and, and I beg your pardon, Arsenal won too. I, I almost forgot about them. Uh, so it's Arsenal, Chelsea, Spurs, Brentford in, in the quarterfinals. That's four London teams and then it's Leicester, Sunderland, uh, Liverpool and West Ham. Sorry, five London teams. Yeah. <laughs> so my question was, who do you want in the next round? Look, I, I think it's always a tough question because the easy answer is to always go for, quote unquote, the weakest team. Uh, maybe on paper, a, a Sunderland might be the easiest team on paper. But look, Rahul, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. I think to win something, Chelsea's road to the Champions League wasn't necessarily easy. easy. I know people say it is, but we had tough teams all the way up until the final. And I think... When you're going for a cup competition, it's one game, it's 90 minutes, you have to perform no matter who it is. And again, on paper, Southampton is quote unquote easy, but they did not make it easy. All of these players come in with a fresh mindset, no matter what their history is in the Premier League or Championship, with it, wherever you're playing, and they want to do well on the day. So I really, I mean, if, if I, I'm forced to answer the question on paper, Sunderland is the team I would want, but I, it doesn't really matter when it comes down to cup competitions. Yeah, you're right. And uh, just touching on Sunderland, they asked his manager who he wanted. And, and you guys, and you may have seen this on social media, he came out and said, well, you know, in the next round, we'll take Arsenal or Spurs, and then we'll take some of the other big boys in, in the semifinal. <laughs> um, so he's he's got jokes and shows you his confidence and his ability. So uh, if we draw them, I'm not sure it might, like you were saying, it'd be, it might not be as easy, but uh, on paper and, and amongst the teams that are left, that's definitely one that I would want to face too. But Liverpool do heavily rotate in this competition too, so right. they may not be a bad option. But uh, that draw is on Saturday, and we will find out who our opponents are in that quarterfinal. Um, and it should be a, a, a fun ride to see if we make it through to the final and maybe we can face Leicester and, and redeem ourselves from that FA Cup last season. That would be fun, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if if uh, Alex was here, who's, by the way, on his European adventure, uh, he would say we would face Leicester and then throw <laughs> their <laughs> their club logo over the back and beat them. But jokes aside, that's the Carabao Cup, guys. And um, like we said, we've already touched on the Newcastle game. We've given you our predictions. We've given you our, our starting 11. Um, anything else to add, Jackie? 
it's been a good couple of weeks here. I think we're in decent form. Yes, we've made some of the games a little more difficult than they need to be. But I think the key over the next few weeks, especially until the international break, is just to continue in that vein and pick up as many points and just stay on top of the table until Christmas. I think that's really, really important. So at least for the next few weeks, just keep winning and then we'll see how everything else plays out. We will. And right before we wrap it up, the Chelsea women are back. They played Man City in the FA Cup semi final. Uh, this weekend on Sunday, on Halloween, actually. Uh, so that should be a good game. And if they win, they'll make it to the final. So wishing them all the best. And uh, may they go on to win last season's FA Cup this season. <laughs> uh, but that wraps it up, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Please continue to subscribe, like, and follow us. It's at the Premier Chels uh, on Google, Apple, Spotify, and Instagram and on Twitter, it's at Premier Chels. Uh, and as always, send us your feedback. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, and it, please go drop a follow for the Toon Army Miami guys as well. Uh, and we will be back later this week to do a Newcastle review. And then we have Malmo coming up next week in the Champions League. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, but until then, stay safe and up the Chels.